Welcome to this video podcast on skeletal dysplasias in our series on pediatric radiology education. This series is designed for the education of radiology residents and fellows. My name is Mary Wires, and today we will go through a brief tour of how to approach a skeletal dysplasia from the radiology perspective. Skeletal dysplasias can be considered generalized disorders of the bones and cartilage, also referred to as osteochondral dysplasias. Many have other clinical and molecular or genetic abnormalities, in addition to the radiographic abnormalities. Their overall incidence is approximately 1 in 5,000 live births. In contrast, a dysostosis refers to a problem that occurs during blastogenesis in the first six weeks of fetal life. This may result in abnormal bone formation, but only in the affected bone or group of bones. The clinician begins by suspecting that a skeletal dysplasia may be present, often based on dysmorphic features of the child, shortened limb segments, or short stature. Many skeletal dysplasias are detected prenatally as well, and some are lethal. We will not be discussing the prenatal evaluation of a skeletal dysplasia within this talk. A molecular diagnosis is possible for many of the skeletal dysplasias, with continual increase in the knowledge of the number of mutations and genetics of these conditions. Based on the nosology and classification of genetic skeletal disorders, published by the American Journal of Medical Genetics, there are 436 skeletal dysplasias, which they have categorized into groups, based on the genetics as well as the phenotypic abnormalities. Here are a couple of examples. Mutations in the fibroblast growth factor receptor 3 gene, or FGFR3, may lead to achondroplasia, the most common non-lethal skeletal dysplasia, or others of varying different clinical severity, including hypochondroplasia and thanatophoric dysplasia. Mutations in the gene for type 2 collagen may lead to some forms of achondrogenesis, hypochondrogenesis, and spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia congenita. The multiple epiphyseal dysplasia and pseudoachondroplasia group is also very common. While pseudoachondroplasia results from a mutation in the COMP gene, MED has multiple types, with many different genetic mutations which have been described in addition to the COMP gene. The standard workup of a skeletal dysplasia is performed from a radiographic skeletal survey. This includes AP and lateral skull x-rays, AP and lateral torso to include the spine and chest wall, AP view of the pelvis, and AP view of the extremities. In a neonate, each extremity may be evaluated on a single radiograph, but in an older child, the upper and lower portions of each extremity should be imaged separately. Finally, AP radiographs of the hands and feet are performed separately and in some cases a bone age may be assessed from the left-hand radiograph. Ideally, a skeletal survey and workup of a skeletal dysplasia are performed early in life because after the growth plates fuse in adolescence, radiographic recognition of some features is much more difficult. We will now go through an overview of how to approach looking at a skeletal dysplasia. It's easy to feel overwhelmed when you're looking at a skeletal survey because of the number of images involved and a feeling that it's going to be something difficult that you've never seen before. However, we will simplify this approach to discuss five features to assess on any given skeletal survey. Bone mineralization, the appearance of the axial skeleton, including any skull, spine, or chest wall abnormalities, the appearance of the appendicular skeleton, including specific patterns of limb shortening and where exactly an abnormality is located within a long bone, the presence of normal growth or growth delay, and finally, any specific or unique features about the skeleton or the soft tissues which may be present in any given case. We will begin by talking about bone mineralization. A background knowledge of the appearance of the normal bones is necessary, as shown here on the left in this 9-month-old. There is normal ossification of the cortex of this long bone, and it has a straight, normal alignment. On the right, here is a lower leg x-ray in a child with osteogenesis imperfecta. You can see that the bone in general is not as ossified, the cortex is not as thick, and you are seeing the complications of the diminished bone mineralization and increased fragility. The tibia and fibula are chronically bowed. Many patients with osteogenesis imperfecta also have fracture complications, as you can see in this lateral spine x-ray in the same patient. There are numerous vertebral body compression fractures leading to abnormal alignment. There are many different types of osteogenesis imperfecta. This is a neonatal form of osteogenesis imperfecta which has severe bone fragility and numerous fractures, many of which happened prenatally. Here you can see numerous chronic rib fractures with resultant deformity of the chest wall as well as fractures of both femurs. The numerous chronic fractures and subsequent incomplete healing and refracturing 
leads to what has been described as an accordion appearance of the long bones. Here is a skull x-ray in a patient with diminished bone mineralization related to hypophosphatasia. You can compare to the normal skull x-ray on the left. In this patient, the bone mineralization is so diminished that it is absent by radiography, as you can see here in the skull and in part of the cervical spine. Here is an example of increased bone mineralization in a patient with osteopetrosis, which is a disorder of osteoclast dysfunction with deficient bone resorption. All of the visualized bones are very dense. In this extremity, you can see a bone within a bone appearance, which is a common feature. And you will notice that at the ends of the bones, there are rachitic changes, which is a complication sometimes seen with osteopetrosis. Although the bone density is increased, most of the available calcium is actually sequestered by the bones, leading to diminished calcium in the bloodstream and subsequent phosphorus wasting by the kidneys. The low serum calcium and phosphorus lead to inadequate mineralization of osteoid in the growing portions of the bones. Other disorders of increased bone mineralization can be seen with the sclerosing bone dysplasias, such as osteopoikilosis, melariastosis, or osteopathia striata, as in this patient. Next, we will move on to an assessment of the axial skeleton, including the skull, spine, and chest wall. Here on the left is a normal lateral skull radiograph in a 9-month-old. Many different skeletal dysplasias have abnormalities of the skull, and it is helpful to look at abnormalities not only of ossification as we saw previously, but also of shape and configuration. On the right, we have a lateral skull radiograph in a patient with cleidocranial dysplasia, which demonstrates numerous wormian bones. These are intrasutural bones, seen as separate bones within the coronal and lambdoid sutures. This has a broad differential diagnosis, including other syndromes such as osteogenesis imperfecta, pycnodysostosis, and hypothyroidism, to name a few. Here is an AP skull radiograph in a patient with thanatophoric dysplasia, demonstrating a clover leaf type configuration of the skull, which is sometimes seen in this setting. This results from diffuse craniosynostosis of all of the sutures except the squamosal suture. Next, we will move on to the spine. On the left, we have a normal lateral spine radiograph in a nine month old. Here on the right is an example of severe platyspondyly, a diffuse, flattened appearance of all of the visualized vertebral bodies in this child with thanatophoric dysplasia. In this patient with Hurler syndrome, the L1 and L2 vertebral bodies are hypoplastic in the AP dimension, with anterior inferior beaking and a focal kyphosis. Relatively similar abnormalities are characteristic of the other mucopolysaccharidoses, with some differences, but the radiographic abnormalities of all of the storage diseases are lumped together and termed dysostosis multiplex. Assessing the chest and ribs is also important. Here on the left is a normal chest x-ray in a four-month-old. Some skeletal dysplasias result in a narrow chest and shortened ribs, as in this patient with Ellis von Creveld syndrome, also known as chondroectodermal dysplasia. You can see the difference in the width of the chest and the length of the ribs. And here is a patient with Jeune syndrome, who has an extremely narrow chest and short ribs. This is also known as asphyxiating thoracic dysplasia. Next, we will move on to an assessment of the appendicular skeleton. We want to assess any specific patterns of long bone limb shortening and where in the bone the abnormality occurs, the epiphysis, the metaphysis, the diaphysis, or some combination of these. And finally, we want to assess the pelvis. It is helpful to look for specific patterns of shortening within the long bones. On the left, we have a normal arm and a nine-week-old. On the right, this is a diagram of different types of limb shortening. At the top, a normal arm. When the proximal segment, or humerus, is shortened, this is rhizomelia. When the middle segment is shortened, mesomelia. And when the distal segment is shortened, acromelia. Finally, when the entire limb is shortened, micromelia. Here is an example of rhizomelic shortening in this child with chondrodysplasia punctata. The humerus, or the proximal segment, is very shortened compared to the more distal segments. Within any given long bone, we want to take a careful look at the growing ends of the bones. Are the epiphyses and metaphyses normal, as in this child on the left? In this child on the right, with chondrodysplasia punctata, we see stippling or multiple tiny punctate dots in place of the normal epiphysis. Here is an example of a metaphyseal abnormality. This patient has pseudoachondroplasia, with widening and flaring of the metaphyses of the distal radius and ulna 
as well as in the hand. And finally, here was a patient with a diaphyseal abnormality. There is marked cortical thickening in the diaphysis of this patient with progressive diaphyseal dysplasia. When assessing the pelvis, look at the overall shape and morphology of the pelvis as well as the appearance of the hips and femoral epiphyses. Here on the left is a normal pelvic x-ray in a 10-week-old child. On the right, we have a child with achondroplasia. We see characteristic abnormal pelvic findings, including squared iliac wings, very flat acetabular roofs with a short, narrow sciatic notch, and what has been described as a champagne glass appearance of the pelvic inlet. This is not the modern champagne flute, but an old-fashioned champagne glass known as a coupe. And here is a patient with cleidocranial dysplasia who has absent pubic bone ossification, a characteristic finding in this condition. Many skeletal dysplasias have aspects of delayed growth, and it may be helpful to calculate the bone age when interpreting a skeletal dysplasia. Here on the left is a normal six-year-old hand. On the right is an example of growth delay. This is a six-year-old boy with hypothyroidism. You can see that the carpal bones are delayed and there are no visible epiphyses. Finally, we want to look for any unusual, unique, or characteristic abnormalities that may not be seen in many skeletal dysplasias. This takes time and experience, but once you have seen a specific abnormality, you are more likely to remember it next time. Here is an example of a five-month-old patient with Larsen syndrome, which is characterized by multiple joint dislocations. There is also a double ossification center in the calcaneus. These unique features allow the radiologist to make the diagnosis more easily. Here is an example of a unique hand abnormality. This is a mitten hand in a patient with Apert syndrome. There is both soft tissue and osseous syndactyly, so that the hand resembles a mitten. Syndactyly may be seen in other syndromes, but the extreme example here is characteristic of Apert syndrome. Here are two helpful resources when you are reading a skeletal dysplasia case. The first is Taby and Lockman's classic textbook on the radiology of syndromes and skeletal dysplasias. And here on the right is a link to a very helpful digital atlas that is available for free from the pediatric radiologists at Seattle Children's Hospital. It includes different age patients with some of the more common skeletal dysplasias, and also includes normal x-rays of patients of similar ages for comparison. Thanks for listening, and I hope you now have a better basic understanding of the approach to a skeletal dysplasia.